our last song today. Thank you very much, everyone. We are Queer Tycho, and this is the Hey Song. I'm Bonnie Sugiyama, and I'm the director of this, uh, the San Jose State Pride Center. So welcome to San Jose State. We're happy to have you all here. I'm also the co-chair of Tadayama, so I'd like to officially welcome you as part of the, the organizing committee to Tadayama. Thank you for making it out today. We're just going to transition really quickly the stage to our next section of the program. So just give us a couple minutes, and we'll be right back. For Queer Taiko and their first performance ever. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to Tadayama. Uh, the, the origins of this conference folks to create um, Okari, which is a, a Japanese American LGBT conference uh, down there about a year and a half ago now. And so some people from, from Northern California went down and, and saw that conference and were like, hey, we should do the same thing up here. And so that's how Tadayama was, was born. Uh, and, and so one of the, the fascinating things, so if, if uh, you're fourth generation like I am, it had to be explained to me about the different, uh, about language because I, you know, I, I don't speak Japanese. And so okari means welcome home. And tadayama means I'm home. And it's usually like kind of a call and response. So usually you say tadayama and people respond with okari. And so we kind of thought it was fitting that uh, LA is, is kind of nicer than we are in a way because they're like, oh, okari, welcome home. And we're like, tadayama, we're home. <laughs> Uh, you know, just kind of deal with us, and you know, then we'll figure it out. Uh, so it, it kind of goes to the activist nature of, of uh, the, the Bay Area, kind of how, um, if you've been to some of our other events, uh, Amy Suyoshi has kind of framed, uh, framed it like that, um, and I think it's a pretty appropriate and fitting to our activist culture here in the Bay Area. So what I'd like to do is uh, we have Congressman Mike Honda here, and I'd like to introduce him so he can come up and, and, and share a few words with us. Uh, the congressman has been, I, I'm gonna go off the cuff just a little bit, has been very good to our community. He has done um, many, many things uh, legislatively and, um, and also sharing his personal story. And you'll hear more about that um, with his daughter Michelle coming up and, and speaking on our panel. Um, but he has been a, a long time friend of the LGBT community and so we're, we're really happy to have him here today. So Congressman Honda represents the, um, the 17th District uh, of California. Uh, he's been a public servant for decades, which he has uh, been lauded for his work on education, transportation, civil rights, and the environment. Congressman Honda serves as a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, a chair emeritus uh, of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Ca uh, Caucus, the founding, uh, founder and chair of the Congressional Anti-Bullying Caucus, a founding member of the LGBT Equality Caucus, and the founder and chair of the Transgender Equality Task Force. He continues to be a strong voice for the cause of social justice, cultural tolerance, and civil rights. Please help me welcome Congressman Mike Honda. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Asians are not quiet. <laughs> It's good to be here, and uh, before I get started, um, let me just uh, uh, introduce um, my daughter, Michelle. I don't know if she's, are you here? Where are you? Hi, Michelle. And where's, where's Melissa? Hi, Melissa. I just wanted you to uh, meet them and just say hello to them, and, uh, and thank you for uh, asking me to sort of do the welcome. I'm a San Jose State grad. Yeah. And uh, 
Well, a bunch of Spartans here, huh? Yeah, I was here 10 years. <laughs> if they had tuition then as they have tuition today, I would have been through it in three years. So. But then it was only $50 a semester. Yo. Shut up. <laughs> so we're here to have fun. And we're here to be together as family. And um, you heard Bonnie give the explanation, you know, I'm home, I'm here. <laughs> I thought, you never left. <laughs> yeah, it's just that we're beginning to recognize um, that we're here. And um, in my introduction also, you know, Buddy talked about the stuff that I worked on. But it just dawned upon me that um, all the stuff that, you know, I work on in terms of policy is about improving in life and quality of other people. But it dawned upon me that I've been working on myself ever since I figured out that <clears throat> um, why do I feel so different? Um, and um, you know, how come I can't understand a lot of things uh, in school? Because I didn't remember that Japanese was my first language and then going through school and forgetting the first language and trying to understand all these things in, in school uh, all came back to me as I became an adult and as a teacher, and then I started to use myself as a um, tool for understanding how to teach, how to look at youngsters, and then how to improve my uh, improve myself. And we all know that all of us who are over fifty, how many of you? Have, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that we grew up with TV, and nothing on TV ever showed anything that had our face. So this whole thing that John Vasconcelos used to say, self-esteem, was really not so much self-esteem as there was nothing out there that reflected who we are. So there was, it was almost like selfless um, kinds of images. So we had to develop our own or we said to ourselves, how come Ricky Nelson's family is so intact? <laughs> You know, how come the father doesn't slap the kid around, you know, and or get spanked? And so the comparison. So I started to learn not to compare myself, and then I started working on my own value and my own dignity. And and so that journey took me to um, a point where uh, you know got married, had family, and then uh, had a great daughter, uh, Michelle, who. Um, had children of her own, and then um, encountered a young lady that said, I'm a girl at 18 months. And then just before she turned three, said, I'm a girl, my name is Melissa, and this is how you spell it. <laughs> and so you know that <clears throat> three words I learned from my daughter, insistence, persistence, and consistence. And when those things happened, she just did um, a, a move that I was watching and learning from, because she became my teacher. And uh, so when that decision started, was made, um, um, the parent became the child, and the child became the parent. And, and, and watching and learning uh, was a magnificent thing and um, <clears throat> being a person that you know been in policy you know I was always an ally with LGBT I knew what PFLAG was I knew where we had to go when AIDS came up and we knew that it was not God's punishment on homosexuals uh, and things like that all these terminology started to fade away and start to relearn unlearn the kinds of things that I was that I was taught, even homophobic jokes. And now it's about pronouns, it's about perception, it's about terminology, it's about presence. And I think that um, when we talk about the intersection of our lives and, and our paths, um, it becomes one that we become reflective of. And so I just wanted to uh, say thank you for this opportunity to just share a little bit. Um, 
as a sensei who's going to be 75. It sounds strange, huh? <laughs> Usually sanseis are the youngest generation. But now we got yonsei and gosei. But uh, as an uh, older sensei, um, I want you to just be able to um, pick up a phone if you ever have a question and call. I've had a few calls from folks around the country about my age, and they say, ah, thanks for talking with me, Mike. You know, I really love my <coughs> grandchildren, but, oh, it's so hard. I say, yeah, I get it. You know, if this is the kinds of things that make life interesting and spicy, that, you know, when we get through that spot, we can be also become teachers through how we behave, through our actions, our thinking. And so we can even have fun with it, you know, and pronouns. I say, how come it's got to be a hurricane? Why can't it be a hemicane? <laughs> or it's a uh, hemorrhoid or a hermoroid? <laughs> <laughs> you, you see? And so when we start to look at re-teaching ourselves, um, then we start to really enjoy and we can make um, the environment of our youngsters and uh, young people and people of LGBTQ uh, safe and secure. And it's a journey towards normalcy. Normalcy. When you sit in a family in the old days, it used to be a binary system, right? Girl, boy. And now we understand that gender and gender identity, sexuality, is a spectrum. And we fit someplace along there. And so it helps us to expand who we are, how we think, and allows people a place to be where they can say, I'm home, never left. Thank you. Before I leave, I just want to uh, present a, this is the political board here. It's a resolution co uh, condom accommodation. <laughs> As you know, English is my second language. <laughs> it's a commendation of the Taidami Bay Area for LGBTQQ advocacy in the Japanese Nikkei community. I, I just want to read a um, couple of um, paragraphs, and I know I'm over my time. Whereas Tadaima means I'm home in Japanese, is a collection of events hosted across Northern California Bay Area for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning individuals, families, and allies who want to learn more about the intersections, and I say the blending, of Japanese American LGBTQQ experience. And whereas uh, Tadaima Bay Area advocates raising awareness, fostering acceptance, and opening dialogue within the Japanese Nikkei community. Family, so we just want to thank all of you for being here and for the leadership. And this is the journey that we're going to help other people take because we're comfortable or we're willing to be uh, more comfortable you know, on this journey. So, uh, Bonnie, would you come up and accept this? Congressman Honda, can we give another round of applause? All right, so I'd like to bring up our panel for this afternoon, or this morning, I guess. We're not really in the afternoon yet. I've already moved on. I've been awake for a while. All right, so in the order that they're entering right now, it is, or, or not, <laughs> throwing off my order here. All right, so this is Michelle Honda, and then we have Aiden Izumi. Marsha Aizumi. Um, one of the things that, that we wanted to talk about really quickly to, to give some context to the conversation is a lot of people have a confusion over what the difference between sexual orientation is and gender identity is. So sexual orientation, a lot of people know it as, as uh, attraction to somebody um, and how that, how that title or um, you know, identity is given is based on what your gender is and what the other person is other person's gender is as far as how sexual orientation is deemed. So, so if you're gay, it you know typically means uh, to to men who are attracted to each other. 
Um, so that's really talking about attraction. So we're talking about your heart um, when we're talking about sexual orientation. And I think that it gets confused with gender identity because we use gender to identify sexual orientation. But gender identity is something completely different. It's actually what, how you see yourself in your head and how you see your own gender. So it's a, personal, it's a personal identity as far as how you identify your own personal gender. Is that making sense for everybody? Okay. So with that, we're going to go into Michelle's story. And um, I'm going to skip the intros just because we're short on time right now. So. Hi. Um, I'm Michelle Honda Phillips. Uh, again, like my father said, my daughter's in the back there as well. Please come say hello after. Um, so just to start out, you know, we live in a society where we learn that gender is binary. There are only boys and girls. That the doctor gets to tell us what we are based upon what's between our legs. This then determines what our parents name us, how we're expected to act, what we're given to wear. It determines who people assume we should be attracted to and sometimes even what profession we should choose. Gender stereotypes are in our everyday lives. Pink is for girls, blue is for boys. But believing in stereotypes is dangerous because they emphasize how we're different rather than how we're alike. Um, for me, it took a long time for me to look beyond the stereotype. My daughter knew when she was 18 months old that she was a girl. She'd say to us, call me sister, daughter, girl. She insisted on it, she was persistent with it, and she was consistent with it. But the catch was, she was assigned male at birth. We gave her hand-me-down clothes from our older son, and we had trucks and um, cars to play with. We didn't know we were perpetuating the stereotype that we now see so clearly. She wanted to be called Melissa at age two. She spoke in a high, fake, high-pitched voice all the time. She begged for princess toys and my little ponies. Uh, she did everything a stereotypical little girl would do, say, or act. So thinking we were good parents, we bought her the sparkles and we threw her the girl-themed birthday parties. But we still thought she was a boy who liked girl things, a boy with feminine qualities, but still a boy. Hindsight is 2020. When she was three, she asked for dance lessons and wanted to wear the pink tutu and the pink ballet shoes. Uh, but we sent her to class in a t-shirt and basketball shorts. And as a mother, I didn't want her teased and I didn't want her to hear the whispers of judgment from the other parents. And now I look back at the pictures from the time and I, and I feel a lot of regret. Can you imagine knowing in your mind and in your heart that you were a girl, knowing that you were like every other girl in class, but no one will listen hard enough because based on appearance, everyone thought you were a boy. All the while I thought I was protecting her, but really, I was the one hurting her by unknowingly having her pretend she was something she wasn't. Every Halloween, she would choose to be things like a cupcake or a hot pink Darth Vader. Uh, when <laughs> Melissa was six years old, she wanted to be a princess for Halloween. A friend lent us a wig that was the same toffee brown color as her hair. It was long and flowing, and I will never forget that exact moment she saw herself in the sliding glass door reflection. That was the moment everything became so clear. Melissa finally saw on the outside what she had known so long on the inside. Her eyes sparkled as she flipped her hair over her shoulder and posed, and a light had gone on in her we had never seen. That very next day, we decided to grow out her hair and to try to recreate the joy that we saw. We wanted to help make her outside match the inside without props. She began to express her gender more and more in public and not so much um, only at home we started to get that there was much more going on that we actually understood. From that point, I spent every night researching um, and watching YouTubes and reading websites and books and blogs and finally learning about transgender youth. It all began to make sense and I cried every night for months, but not from sadness, from guilt. Every story I read made me realize even more that we did not allow our child to live as authentically as we had thought. We eventually showed Melissa the videos of other trans youth and asked, is this how you feel? Is this what's going on? And then we could tell by the emotion in her face as, we, as she watched the stories and her body visually sighed with relief. Everything finally made sense. And like most nights prior, I cried again. But this time, I cried because I was so thankful that we had been given the knowledge and the understanding 
and the opportunity to see our daughter. I may never fully understand what Melissa feels, but I can respect her circumstance, give her my unconditional love, and teach her about handling social pressures and ignorance with grace and understanding. There are people who fear what they don't understand, people who are unintentionally offensive, but encouraging questions and educating has allowed Melissa to come out stronger. She is paving the way for others to do things that some are afraid to pursue and discovering allies along the way. Increasing numbers of trans youth well under the age of 13 years old are speaking up about their gender identity. They're able to take blockers and who will never have to go through the opposite puberty. Because of this, people question why we don't just blend in quietly into the background. In honor of this week's Transgender Day of Visibility, I can tell you that living out loud is our only choice. She is worthy of standing tall and proud of who she is. We live out loud because there are so many people who haven't yet found their voice. Since Dad's famous tweet heard around the world, um, we've been given opportunities to tell our story locally, uh, regionally, nationally, even internationally. And we don't take that responsibility lightly. We work to educate about the gender spectrum and to teach people to look beyond the stereotypes, beyond the binary, beyond what our eyes tell us. There is still a long way to go, and there's a noticeable and severe lack of resources for families of trans youth under the age of 13. For now, we must learn to recognize the insistence, persistence, and consistence of a child's gender identity, to shift our culture and allow them to explore the gender spectrum, help them find their voice, and shed light on the needs of the family so desperately in need of support. For Melissa, being transgender does not define who she is. Her brain and her body may not match, but for all intents and purposes, I think we can agree that it's really no one's business. Because without question, she has my love and support for living out loud. She's my daughter, she's my heart, and she's my tour guide on this phenomenal journey. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, next up we have Aiden Yes. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is good. I think it'll be okay. All right. Um, so I'm gonna kind of start my life story in middle school um, because my I had a pretty ordinary elementary school experience. Um, but when I got to be in middle school, um, suddenly gender separated um, activities came into play. So it was um, boys and girls sports teams and girls and boys locker rooms. And I had a lot of friends that were female that were interested in doing things like drill team or um, into the boys that they thought were cute. And my guy, my friends who were male um, suddenly didn't want to include me in activities or into kind of their social circle because it either indicated that they liked me. Um, actually, I think it was probably just because it indicated that they liked me and that wasn't really the relationship that we had. And so I started to face a lot of social isolation and um, I became depressed and struggled to find kind of my place among my peer groups. Um, my only like saving grace in middle school was my sixth grade math and science teacher who let me be her like student helper pretty much like through the entire, my entire middle school experience. Um, so I was eating lunch with her in the teacher's lounge and getting to like just help her make photocopies or um, staple papers, but she just gave me a place that I could feel comfortable and belong. Um, when I got to be in high school, um, my sophomore year of high school to be specific, uh, I actually came out, kind of my coming out 1.0 um, as a lesbian, and at the time that was all I understood about uh, my identity. I didn't know anything about gender identity. Um, I just knew that at the time I was a girl and that I was attracted to girls and so I kind of equated it to like one plus one and it's, that's just the only identity I could see that fit for me at the time. Um, but when I came out I went to a pretty conservative high school um, in Southern California and I became pretty much the walking target for students to bully. Um, so from my sophomore year to my senior year in high school uh, I was just consistently targeted in the halls um, with comments and things that people would say. Um, and so when I got to my senior year of high school, um, I told my mom I'm not gonna go back to school. 
Uh, I didn't really tell her why, because if you get to know my mom, she's, you know, you don't mess with her children. She'll go to the school and kick the doors down um, and, and, you know, stand up for her kids. And so I didn't tell her that I was being bullied. I just told her I was, um, you know, I was struggling with anxiety. Um, she went to school anyway, and she told them, you know, is there anything we can do? And I was fortunate the school let me finish my high school experience uh, through independent study, so I got to email my assignments in, um, but I didn't actually have to, have to attend class. Um, but I, did, I didn't get to experience the things that people look forward to their senior year of high school, which are like prom and graduation and grad night, um, because they were things that would have involved me being socially um, kind of integrated with my peers, and they were people that really I didn't want to be around because they made high school um, really difficult for me. Um, but there were some things, you know, years later when I decided to transition after high school um, that allowed me to heal from those experiences and also that helped my family become closer. Um, I wanna go to the next slide. All right, so these are the feelings that I think that we went through, or some of them, that kind of give you a peek into the experience of when I was struggling and then kind of coming out through the other side. But I really struggled a lot with um, guilt and shame. Um, I felt like I hadn't really taken into consideration the experience of my family um, when I decided to transition. I, a lot of people who know me can tell you I don't do delayed gratification very well. Uh, I like to do things and when I want them, I want them yesterday actually. So um, I didn't stop and think that they may have to tell people in their lives or you know tell people that they work with um, you know, when it comes up in conversation about their child. And so I never, I felt really bad because here I was moving forward as quickly as I could and I didn't stop to think that maybe they needed some time to process and to adjust to these changes because I had been, um, you know, I was 20 when I transitioned, so for 20 years called by a certain name and certain pronouns and was now going by a different name and different pronouns. So that just needed some adjustment in time. Um, I also needed to show a lot of compassion because of that change and, and the time to process, there was time needed for these things to happen. And so sometimes, you know, the wrong name was used or the wrong pronouns were used. And so I was, I did my best to show compassion back to my family. Um, and just to be patient with them and acknowledge that I knew that they were trying their best to, um, to grow and to learn and to call me by the names and pronouns that um, I was using. And then I needed to find self-acceptance. Um, I always had this picture of myself with a beard, and I don't have a beard still, I'm very disappointed, but I've learned to accept <laughs> this um, for the most part. Um, but I needed to accept myself regardless of where my transition was taking me because I, you know, you never know what, where it's gonna go and where it's gonna lead you. And so I just had to find with myself um, things that I could love and accept. Um, and then really, last, I needed to show gratitude because I realized that um, I have had the privilege of being able to access medical, uh, medically related transition services, and I've also had the privilege of having my family support me throughout this process, and I know that that is unfortunately not the case for everybody. So, um, yeah, thank you. All right, next we have Marsha Aizumi. Thank you so much for being here today and, and to be willing to listen to our stories. Um, I think stories are the things that could. I cry a lot. <laughs> and you know what Aiden says, Mama, you can't cry because you only have so many minutes. And <laughs> you can't spend two minutes crying. But I, I guess um, I'm just so grateful for all of you who are here that are willing to listen and, and hear our stories and, and want to really understand what it's like uh, to be a transgender individual and to be um, uh, a parent of a transgender individual. So I am going to talk a little bit about some of the feelings that I had and, and hopefully some of the lessons uh, that we learned as well. Um, like Aiden, I went through a lot of guilt and shame. Um, and I want you to know that that was something I think that came um, from my Asian heritage because I really wanted to honor my family and my ancestors. Um, but did, today I look back and I say, and I'm so proud of my son. Um, he went through so much, many years alone, where I had a lot of guilt. Um, but he has not let those challenges, adversity, um, 
he has not let them defeat him. He has allowed them to define him, to be the strong and, um, and, and still compassionate and caring individual that he is today. Um, I think I went through a lot of sadness and I also grieved uh, because I lost my daughter and of course I was going to get a son but I had a process that I need to go through uh, in order to accept Aiden and of course my husband and I, our family accepts him 100% um, and today I, I look back and I'm not sad, I don't grieve, I'm filled with joy, I'm filled with so much joy for the life that he has allowed us to create. And I feel with so much joy because I just feel like uh, this has been an amazing journey for our family. Um, I also want to talk about the fear. I think that was one of the strongest feelings that came up to me initially when Aiden first came out as lesbian and then transgender, uh, uh, transitioned to be transgender. Um, I was afraid of the world that he was going to have to grow up in. I was afraid that he wouldn't find happiness or love. And, um, you know, as a parent, what you want for your child is to have opportunities to really feel fulfilled and contribute. And I was afraid he wouldn't have that chance. Um, but today, I'm filled with hope. And there are a lot of challenges that still remain for our community. Um, and there's a lot of challenges that remain around the country and around the world. But I believe that we're moving in the right direction. And I want to thank Con Congressman Honda for doing so much of the work that's bringing this um, to, into focus and making people really stop and listen and, um, and try to understand. So um, those were some of the things that I initially went through and transitioned to, um, you know, to pride and joy and hope. And these are some of the lessons that I learned along the way. Um, I learned that I, I need to know why I was going to do this. Of course, everybody says, you love your child, and I do. I did love Aiden, but I need to even search more for what that meant for me. And what I realized was Aiden was not going to be different on the inside just because his outside was going to change. He would still be funny. He would still have a kind heart. Um, he would still um, want to contribute and be a good member of society. And so for me, my commitment was to stand by him so he could be all those things. And so people could recognize the value that he could bring, um, not just because of his gender, but because of who he was. Um, also, I think I talk a lot about fear because that still is something that I think is part of um, what I feel as a mother. But I learned that fear could be overcome by education. Uh, there was a lot of stories I made in my head about his life and things that were going to happen. And I think for me, those stories started to become less. Um, and they, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> keep track of time. Um, and they became uh, not as important because I knew what the truth was. Reaching out for support was another valuable lesson that I learned, how important it is in order for me to be strong. Reaching out for support was a sign of strength. Um, I think, thank you, honey. He's my best supporter, thanks for me. <laughs> um, I think the last couple of things um, that I learned were that to keep my heart open was such a valuable thing. There were so many times I wanted to close my heart down because I was so afraid. Um, I was afraid for our family and I was afraid for Aiden. But if I closed my heart, then I couldn't feel and I couldn't learn and I couldn't experience. Uh, so keeping an open heart was so important. And what that required was I said, I'm sorry when I made mistakes. Um, to Aiden, I said, how can I do it better? Um, because I, I didn't have a manual. Um, and I think I also knew that I needed to be responsible for this journey with my family and with my son. It wasn't up to him and it wasn't up to anybody else, but it was up to me. And so whatever it took, it was going to be um, what I was willing to do in order to keep our family connected and uh, to keep my son um, knowing that he was enough and he would be valued by society. 
Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is gratitude. I think the more grateful I am, the more things come into my life that I'm grateful for. And so I think I want to close with this, how grateful I am for each of you that is here. I'm grateful that you're here and you want to learn. And I'm grateful that you're going to go out after today, I think, and be different. And um, you're going to be part of the change that we see in the world. So thank you so much for having us here. And I think my time's up now. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>
So, and I think you're coming with that love. I can already see it. There's another question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was great. Also, yeah, I think you talked about the test, the technical aspects of that a little bit. You know, as you know, framed as love, and it's you know knowing the person that you're coming out to, like. How do they receive messages better, you know, different types of news? Is it like, do they learn better through media, through writing? How do they process? Are they internal processors or the external processors? So those are all different factors in, in figuring out ways to, to come out to folks. And can I just add, I'm, I, I don't know if we're all going to be here the whole day. Um, Michelle, are you going to be here? Um, but I hope that if anybody has any questions, and I know we're running out of time, that you stop us. And you just say, can I have, you know, five minutes to talk with you? Because I think we're here to share information, but we're also here to be a support for you. Um, so just, I want to put that out. I, I hope I'm not speaking for no, all of us, and that's mm -hmm. not okay. <laughs> no, I mean, please, if, I, I try to be available to people as much as I can. So anyone has any questions, feel free. If I can just say one thing about, you know, grandparents and just family members and friends in, in general, give them the, the credit that they help raise your family and that if they're your friends, give them the opportunity to accept, you know, give them the opportunity to, to tell them and respect them by telling them, um, you, may, you may be surprised. So Marsha's invitation comes with a caveat though is like not after this session because she's got to <laughs> do a breakout session so catch her after the breakout session during lunch or sometime later on in the, during the day because she's got to run from here over to another building <laughs>